Praise the Lord. Everybody, I said, praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight. For those who are coming for the first time, we're so happy you are here. And we pray you'll keep coming, that the Lord will perfect everything concerning your life in Jesus' name. For the old timers, where are the old timers? The Lord keep you learning. And what you learn will benefit every one of us in Jesus' name. Make you stronger. Take you higher. Go deeper in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your spirit revealing deep things to everyone as we come. We're asking tonight, you open the pages of the scripture and expound everything to us in Jesus' name. And the appropriate grace that will go along with your revelation of the word, you give to everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Because the men, the women, the members, the ministers, we ought to be. We pray, Lord, to touch the life of everyone. Our children, our youths, our students, our fathers and mothers, adults, everyone, touch us tonight in Jesus' name. Do something new as we reveal your truth to everyone. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And the church of God said, Amen. Amen. We're coming to Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 13. Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 13. And he brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer little children, permit little children, allow those little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up, those children, in his arms, and put his hands upon them, and blessed them, and blessed them. The Lord will bless every one of us in Jesus' name. That's the passage you are looking at tonight. And the topic of our study tonight is the necessity of childlikeness in kingdom citizens. Those who are going to enter the kingdom of God, those who are allowed to become citizens of the kingdom, the Lord wants them to have the heart of a child, the attitude of a child, the disposition of a child. In fact, it says, if we do not have that attitude, that disposition, that heart of a child, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's so necessary then that we have child likeness so that we can be citizens of the kingdom of God. The topic again, the necessity of child likeness in kingdom citizens. We divided the message to three parts. Number one, contradictory actions that displease the king. There's a king in the kingdom. And the king of the kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ, king of kings and lord of lords, there are actions that displease him. You read that in verse 14. And when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. Point number two. Childlike acceptance demanded for the kingdom. If we're going to enter the kingdom, if we're going to be partakers of the kingdom, 
He wants us to have childlike acceptance. That is, the word he preaches, the gospel he gives us, he wants us to have the attitude of a child, the acceptance of a little child. Look at the middle of verse 14. Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, certainly, assuredly I say unto you, whosoever, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he cannot enter therein. Point number three, Christ's acknowledged blessings distributed with kindness. Christ's acknowledged blessings distributed with kindness. Look at verse 16. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. May God bless all our children in Jesus' name. God bless all our parents in Jesus' name. And God bless the whole church in Jesus' name. We're coming back to point number one. Contradictory actions that displease the king. What does that mean? Actions that are contrary to the action the king, Christ, would have taken. Actions that go contrary to the will of the king, the word of the king. Actions that go contrary to the purpose of the king. Contrary, contradictory actions that displease the king. Come back to Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 13. And he brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. You can tell here that the action of the disciples of Christ displeased him. In fact, it says he was much displeased. What are the things that displease the Lord? Because we need to understand from what we have read here that there are actions, there are attitudes, there are behaviors, there are things people do that displease the Lord. Number one, you can tell, hindering other souls' salvation. That displeases the Lord. When people are brought to the Lord, He wants to touch them. He wants to transform them. He wants to change them. He wants to prepare them for the kingdom. He wants them to enter into the kingdom of God. And when anyone, a disciple, a minister, a preacher, a follower of Christ, hinders those souls from getting to the Savior and getting to salvation, that displeases the Lord. Number two, driving sinners away from Christ. When these people came and they brought their children, that Christ will touch them. They didn't allow them. They didn't want them to come. They want to disallow them. They drove them away. You can't see the Lord. That displeases the Lord. If you have come to know the Lord, and you are a servant of God, you are a disciple of the Lord, other people now want to come, and you judge each on feet. You judge each not right. That they will not come near Christ, and you drive sinners away from Christ, that displeases the Lord much. Number three, erecting barriers between the lost and the shepherd. When you make an invisible wall, but it's a wall all the same, a wall of demarcation, and you separate those people who are lost from getting to the shepherd, that much displeases the Lord. Number four, when you walk contrary to the Lord, the Lord 
has come for everyone. He wants everyone saved. He wants everyone coming to him, touching him, he touching them, getting saved, being transformed, and you walk contrary to that purpose of the Lord. He came that sinners might be saved. He came that people might come to know the Lord. And you walk contrary to the Lord that displeases the Lord. Number five, where there's hardness of heart. The Lord wanted their hearts to be so soft that anyone that came to him, there'll be a doorway, there'll be the gate to get to the Lord. But then, instead of being a gate, instead of being a door, they closed the door. And their hearts were hardened against people that wanted to come to the Lord when your heart is like that. And you're not thinking of people's salvation. You're not thinking of their healing. You're not thinking of their association with the Lord. You're not thinking of their conversion. That hardness of heart displeases the Lord. Number six, lack of love for parents and children. When you look at children, and you're not thinking of their own joy, their own happiness, you're not thinking of their desire, you're not thinking of their parents either, and you do not have the love that Christ has to those parents, that Christ has to those children. Say, no, no, it doesn't have time for you. You're not the kind of person he wants to associate with. When you have lack of love for parents and children, that much displeases the Lord. Lack of faith. When you lack faith in the Lord, and you do not think that faith will extend to all the people that may come, the down and out, the up and high, the people that are far away, all people that come. When you don't have faith that the Lord will take in everyone, you think he'll take in this one, he'll take in that one, but he will not take everybody. That lack of faith in God displeases the Lord. Number eight, when you do not have the mind of Christ, let this mind be you which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ has this might, a passionate might, a compassionate might, a loving mind, a loving mind, a mind that attracts people to himself, but you don't have that mind, you have a different mind, not having the mind of Christ that displeases the Lord. Number nine, willful sin. Willful sin. If you have been with the Lord for one week, you be with the Lord for one month. You understand his heart. You understand his mind. You understand what had taken place before when a woman of, of the South Phoenician woman was coming after the Lord and they said, cast this woman away, send her away because she cries after us. And then he said, I cannot give the children's bread to dogs. And the woman came and said, yes, Lord truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs under the table. And he said, great is your faith. They would have known the mind of Christ. They would have known what Christ would have wanted if, as the children were brought unto him. Willful sin, willful disobedience then displeases the Lord. Let's look at those verses again. I'm reading from chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 13. And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And the disciples, the disciples rebuked those that brought them. But Jesus, when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. Let's look at First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians, I'm reading from chapter 2, the things that displease the Lord. And you want to check up your own life, check up your own attitude, check up your own heart, and check up your disposition. How do you do your own Christian ministry and your own Christian life? What are the things you do that may be displeasing the Lord? In Second Thess First Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. 
for ye brethren became followers of, of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Look at verse 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men. They please not God. They are contrary to all men. They are contrary to the joy of people, contrary to their salvation, contrary to their coming to the Lord, and that displeases the Lord. Verse 16, for being able to speak to the Gentiles, like the disciples drove uh, those uh, parents away, you cannot bring the children, you don't have anything to do with Christ. So the Jews were also saying, there's no reason why you're going to pray to the Gentiles, forbidding to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. When you separate sinners from the Savior, when you forbid sinners hearing the gospel, when you hinder sinners coming to know the Lord, that displeases the Lord. In 1 Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. You see that? They came out of Egypt. They were saved. They were restored into fellowship with God. And they came wanting to go and planning to go to the land of promise. And it says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. God was displeased concerning them. Why? And what happened? And they were overthrown in the wilderness. And now these things are written for our learning. An example, that for the intent, to the intent, that we should not lost after evil things, as they also lost it. That displeases the Lord. When the Lord has bought us with the blood of the Lamb, the Lord has saved us. And the Lord has given us eternal life. And then we turn around and we're lost after evil things. We're not going to please the Lord. Neither be ye idolaters as some of them were idolaters. And as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us be, neither let us commit fornication. As some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ. As some of them also tempted and they were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye. As some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things are punched unto them. For examples, and they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The Lord was displeased with them because they went back to the things they had forsaken. When you as a Christian, you have left Egypt, you have left the world, you have left all the pollution, all the defilement of the world. And you're on your way to heaven. And then you begin to lust after the things of the world. And you're leaning after the things of the world. And you're murmuring and complaining. And the way gets you discouraged. That displeases the Lord alone. It's not only what the disciples did. Yes, what they did displeased the Lord. But when you turn back from the Lord, that also displeases the Lord. We're looking at numbers. Because we were told with many of them, God was not well pleased. What happened to them? What did they do? They didn't please the Lord. And it said, these is a reaching for our learning upon whom the ends of the world are come. So that we will not do what they did. So we will not displease the Lord. We're coming to Numbers chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 1. Numbers chapter 11. Reading from verse 1. 
And when the people complained, when the people murmured, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. It displeased the Lord. When you complain about the word of God, you complain about the church, you complain about the leadership, and you murmur, and you criticize, that displeases the Lord. In fact, the Bible said that Christ was much displeased. And these people, as they murmured, as they complained, as they grumbled, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. And then it says, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the hindermost parts of the camp. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. When you cry for nothing, superficial things, you forget the grace has given you. You forget your salvation. You forget the manna you are collecting every day. You forget the water out of the rock that you have been drinking. You forget the goodness of the Lord towards you. And then a minor, a minor discomfort, a little sin, you begin to murmur and cry and weep. He says, we are going to go on. What about this? What about that? That displeases the Lord as well. I come into Deuteronomy chapter 9. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, here we're reading from verse reading from verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 9, reading from verse 16. The things that displease the Lord. And you want to check up in your own life in this new year. How have you been living your life? How do you use your mouth? How do you use your eyes? How do you use uh, the substance that you have? And how do you react? How do you respond to the way the Lord is leading us in his kingdom? When we do things like the children of Israel did, when we do things like the disciples of Christ did in their ignorance and in their indiscipline and indulgence, God is displeased. We're looking in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 16. And I looked and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten cow. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. Backsliding displeases the Lord. Turning away from the Lord displeases displeases the Lord. Maybe the, the leader Moses had gone away for a week or two or for a few weeks and then you say, why is that Moses? Why is that leader? We thought he lead us to the land of promise as to this Moses, we don't know what has become of him. And then you raise up an idol. Then you raise up an, an idea. You raise up a new doctrine and you raise up a new approach. We don't know what has happened to him. He's gone to the mountain. Maybe he's dead over there. And then you go astray. That displeases the Lord. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, for I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure. You see that? Hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wrought against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me in that time also. Verse 20. And the Lord was very wroth, very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. The Lord was angry with Aaron. He was displeased about Aaron. Why? He didn't have any backbone. He was a compromiser. A little scene, a little time. Moses was not around. And then they told him, they said, you know, consider our case. Consider our situation. We know the word of God says this, but look at the way we are. 
Why are we going to be following the Lord and following the word of God? And then we are suffering. They were still eating manna every day. We are suffering. The Lord was still protecting them with the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. We are suffering. And the Lord was still shielding them from all their enemies. We are suffering. Make us gods that will go before us. And Aaron the compromiser, a compromising leader, a compromising preacher, a compromising pastor, a compromising minister who cannot contain earnestly for the word and for the doctrine once delivered unto the saints that displeases the Lord. When Moses came back and said, Aaron, why have you done this? What have these people done to you that you did this? He said, Moses, my brother, you know the people? They've been ready to stone me. The people that cannot take any affliction, any opposition, any persecution, they stand for the truth as long as things are all right, as long as people are smiling at them. When there is opposition, a little difficulty, when there is affliction, persecution, they cannot stand. The Lord is angry with such people. I pray as you compare the word of God with your life, or you compare your life with the word of God, if there are things in your life that God is not happy with, that displeases God, you will turn around. I said you will turn around. A new change will come for every one of us in this new year in Jesus' name. We're looking at Second Samuel, Second Samuel chapter 11. In Second Samuel chapter 11, I'm reading the last verse there. It's in verse 27. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house. And she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Displeased the Lord. Uh, you understand what David had done? David should have gone to the battlefield. He sent Joab. And Uriah, the uh, husband of Beersheba, also went to the battlefield. And the husband of this Beersheba was so faithful, was so honest, was so devoted, and was so disciplined. He was on the battlefield. But then David committed adultery with the wife of such a faithful man in Israel. And so to cover up, he called Uriah's come. And then give him wine to drink, make him drunk. But the man, even in that stage, will not go back home to his wife. And, uh, you know, people said, you know, the, the, the uh, king said to him, are you not going to visit your wife so that he will meet with his wife and David can cover up everything. But the man said, the ark of the Lord is on the battlefield. How can I go and take any time or pleasure or rest at home? And so David wrote a letter to this, with this, a faithful man, honest man, loyal man, and then sent him to the battlefield and instructed uh, Joab to put him in the hard part of the battle, kill him, destroy him. And Joab did that. The man was dead. And David now thought he was at liberty. After all, her husband is dead. I can now take her. And the thing that David did displeased the Lord. We are workers and we are leaders. You are a pastor. You are an overseer. There's a brother that's so faithful. Anything you tell him to do, he'll go and do it. You use his car. You use everything that he has. And yet, as the pastor, as uh, the fellow trusted you as a pastor, you are doing evil with the wife. You are messing up with the wife. What you do displeases the Lord. If you die in that condition, you're going to perish forever. Thank God David repented. But how many people do things like that and they do not have a chance to repent? The Lord have mercy on us. I can't hear my people say amen. First Chronicles chapter 21. In First Chronicles chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 7. There are people that measure the commandments of God. 
and they measure the things they do. They say this one is small. They say this one is minute. They say this one does not matter. Look at First Chronicles chapter 21. Uh, I'm reading from verse 7. First Chronicles chapter, 20, chapter 21 verse 7. And God was displeased with this sin. Therefore, he smote Israel. What happened? David just woke up one day. All the victory that God had given him, even himself alone, without any other warrior, without any soldier to go with him. Your God always gave him the victory. He was not looking away from God. He wanted to know the number in his army. And he told Job to go and count them. And Job said, how are you going to do that? The Lord has always been giving us the victory. He said, I am the king. I told you to go and count them. And he went and counted them because his mind was turned away from the Lord. Not depending upon the Lord anymore, but depending upon the number in his army. And it says, and the sin that he did was displeasing unto the Lord. And David said unto God in verse 8, I have sinned greatly because I have done the sin. But now I beseech thee. Do, do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. There are people in their Christian lives, the Lord is not in their thoughts. Whatever they do, they just do. And they will tell themselves, that's a little sin, that's a minor sin, because it is minor. I don't need to pray about that one. I don't need to read the word of God about that one. I don't need to seek out the way of God and the will of God concerning this. But the Lord wants us to check up from him what we are doing and what we ought to do. When God is not in our thought, all I want to do is, Joab, go and do that. Joab, go and go to that place. Joab, go to the other place. And Job is even feeling the uh, discomfort and is saying, would this be right? Is this the way we should go? Are we depending upon the arm of flesh? Or are we depending upon the Lord? David said, don't bring in God now. Don't bring in the word of God. What I tell you to do, go and do. And we displease the Lord by not thinking about what we do, whether it aligns with the word of God or not. Look at Psalm 10. In Psalm 10, I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 10, verse 4. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. God is not in all his thoughts. When you plan your life, God is not in your thoughts. You travel, God is not in your thoughts. You have associations, God is not in your thoughts. You want to make money, God is not in your thoughts. You're just going through life like a blind man. And the light of the gospel is shining, and you shield yourself from the light of the gospel. God not in your thoughts. That displeases the Lord. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. We're reading from verse 12. Isaiah 59. Reading from verse 12. In verse 12, here is what the word of God says. For transgressions are multiplied before him. When... You live your life and you transgress this way, transgress that way, and you just live anyhow until transgressions multiply and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. As for our iniquities, we know them. You know them and there's no plan to repent. You know them, there's no plan to make restitution. You know them, there's no way, there's no plan to return from them. You know you don't have the clear conscience of a righteous child of God. But you keep on doing what you are doing. There's guilt there. 
there's condemnation there. There's the knowledge that you are not living right. And you know, it says, in transgressing and living against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. You tell lies. You deceive. And it just comes readily like that. Because now you've gone into the habit of you want to protect yourself. You want to look good before the people. You want to have your way. Sometimes you are telling the lie to cover somebody else. Sometimes you are telling the lie to cover an action you have taken. It says, we have uttered words of falsehood. In verse 14, the judgment is turned away backward. And justice standeth afar off. For the truth is falling in the street, and equity cannot enter. Look at verse 15 now. Ye, truth faileth. And he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. The one who lives by the word, the one who preaches by the word, the one who stands by the word, he becomes the prey. He becomes the people you jump over and the people you say, Why are you so straight and straightforward? Why are you so narrow minded? Why are you so, so keeping to the word of God? And that offends you when you do that. And the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment. It displeased him that there was no truth. As you look at the word of God, you understand the things that displease God. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11. Reading from verse 6. It says in verse 6, But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Are you walking by faith? Are you living by faith? Are you talking by faith? Are you living your Christian life by faith? Are you doing everything you do with your faith in God intact? I know God is on the throne. I know this is the will of God. And that may not be the way of the world. And the world may be opposed to me because I go that way. But I'm going to live by faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The things that displease the Lord. Hindering other souls from salvation, driving sinners away from Christ, erecting barriers between the lost and the shepherd, and walking contrary to the way of the Lord, hardness of heart, lack of love for parents and children, lack of faith in God, not having the mind of Christ or willful sin, all those things displease the Lord. As the Lord speaks to us and we discover the things that displease the Lord in our lives by the grace of God, we'll turn away from them. We'll repent of them. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, will wash every one of us whiter than snow in Jesus' name. Point number two now. Childlike acceptance demanded for the kingdom. Demanded by the king. If we are going to enter the kingdom of God, we need the acceptance of the word of God in a childlike way, with a childlike mind. Come to Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 14, the middle part of verse 14. Suffer so little children, little children, to come unto me. And forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. But really I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, as a little child, whosoever will not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. He wants us to accept the word of God. You hear about repentance. You accept as a little child. 
about restitution, you accept as a little child. About regeneration, ye must be born again, you accept as a little child. Infant baptism cannot save, you accept as a little child. Could your tears forever flow and your zeal no longer know? All that for sin cannot atone. You accept as a little child all the religion that you practice and the worship, superficial worship that you render. All that cannot save, you accept as a little child. And except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of those religious Pharisees, you can in no wise enter the kingdom of God. You accept as a little child, follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You accept as a little child. It is only that childlike acceptance demanded for the kingdom by the king that allows us to enter into the kingdom of God. When it says, look at this in chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 15. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. What does that mean? Accept his word like a little child. The child comes to the world and a child is not going to create a new language. The language the parents are speaking, he accepts, she accepts, that's the right language. The word, the precept, the things to do, that's fire. He didn't know fire. Don't touch it. That's bleach. Don't take it. That's um, stove. Don't touch it. He didn't know any of that. But he accepted everything that's a child. And when you are told the word of God and you accept like a child, that's how to get to the kingdom of God. Number one, you accept his word. Number two, you accept his will. This is the will of God. And this is what you do. You are not listening. You are not asking why. You are not saying, but can't I have my own way? The little child does not know there's any other way. There's any other will. The will that the father, the mother reveals, that little child accepts that. Number three, you accept his way. This is the way of righteousness. And this is the way of serving the Lord. And if you, there's no alternative, that's the thing to do. And the little child will accept. And the Lord wants us to accept His word, His will, His way, His wisdom. The little child does not uh, try to match His uh, puny wisdom or the wisdom of the father or the mother. The wisdom of the father has spoken. That's the school to go. That's the place to go. And that little child knows that that is the ultimate. That's the final. You accept his warning like a little child. The Lord will warn us. The Lord has been warning us. And the Lord gives one. The parents give warning to the children. You won't go that way. That will destroy your life. You won't go that way. That will hinder your progress. Number one, you accept his word like a child. You accept his will like a child. You accept his way like a child. You accept his wisdom like a child. You accept his warning like a child. Number six, you accept his weight like a child. There are times the parents will have to tell the children, I want this, I want to eat this, I want to wear this, I want this. And the parents will say, this is not the time, wait. And the child has no choice. That child accepts because that little child trusts the parents. There are times the Lord will tell you, wait. And you're not saying, why should I wait? I cannot wait. That's how you said the other time. Wait all the time. Wait all the time. I'm fed up. I cannot wait. A little child will not do that. And that's what the Lord is saying. He's saying you will accept his wait. Like a little child. Number seven, you accept his watchmen. You accept his watchmen. The, pe the people he has sent to be your teacher. 
and to be your leader and to lead you in the right way. You accept like a child. A child is sent to school and a child does not come back the first day after school. Daddy, I don't like that teacher. Daddy, mommy, I don't like that teacher. I want another teacher. I want another school. Like a little child, a saint, what you mean? My saint Jeremiah, my saint Isaiah, my saint Micah, my saint Peter, my saint Paul, who was an injurious man, now he is converted. You accept his watchman like a little child. That's what the Lord was telling them. Come back to Mark chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 15. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. How does a little child accept? Number one, no argument. You see, the people who argue with the word of God, why repentance? Can't I just believe? Why holiness? Can't I just believe? Why restitution? Can't I just believe? They are not receiving the word of God, the will of God, the way of God, like a little child. For that little child, no argument. Number two, no alteration. No alteration. The little child doesn't know any better. What you tell the child is what the child understands. And there is no alteration, no going to the backyard and changing, altering what the child has been told. Number three, no arrogance. No arrogance. I can't take that. I won't take that. I know better than that. I can tell you something higher, something better. What you have told me is not right. That's not the word of a little child. There's no arrogance. Number four, there's no addition. No addition. You won't be adding to the word of God, adjusting the word of God, measuring the word of God, doing it your own way, adding local, local herbs, and adding local proverbs, and adding all those uh, traditional things. There's no addition. Number five, there's no annulment. You'll not annul. You'll not cancel the word of God and say, no, I reject that. I do away well with that. I throw that one away. There is no an annulment of the word of God. Number six, there's no abandonment. You'll not abandon the word of God and then be following out of vanity. A little child, when he hears, when a child hears, does what the parents have said. This is what to do. I'm not talking of those who have grown up and they have learned the way of the world and the way of rebellion. We're talking about little, little children who do not know how to do any of these things. No abandonment of the watch of God. Number seven, no alternative. No alternative. I won't come back home. It's when they have, you know, gone to uh, the streets and they have seen what other children are doing. But the little, little toddler, the little child, there's no alternative. He knows that this is where God has placed me and I'm going to be there. And I pray God will help us that we'll receive the word of God like a little child in Jesus' name. Did I hear any men on the floor? Look at Psalm 131, Psalm 131, receiving the word, receiving his way, receiving his will, receiving the warning, receiving his wisdom, receiving the watchman and receiving the weight like a little child. In Psalm 131, I'm reading from verse 1, Lord, my heart is not haughty. Nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters, in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child. I'm not looking for high things, I'm not arrogant, I'm not haughty. I'm not looking for alternative. I have behaved myself and quieted myself 
as a child that is weaned from his mother, from his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. We're looking at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. We're reading from verse 3. Matthew chapter 18. Reading from verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Actually, Jesus was talking to his disciples. They had left all and they were following him. But they were so occupied with position seeking. Who will be the greatest among us? Who will be the number one among us? Who is the most important among us? Who has the best title among us? And Jesus said unto them, You know what? You're coming out, following after me, will not guarantee you're getting to the kingdom of God because except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Whosoever, Peter, pay attention. Whosoever, James, pay attention. Whosoever, John, pay attention. Whosoever, Matthew, pay attention. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Why are we going to be in church and not get to the kingdom of God? That's what they were in another church before. And when you saw that the way of that church, the words in that church, your service in that church will not get you to heaven. That's how you came here. That's how you have the word of repentance. That's why you went on your knees and you wept bitter tears and you were converted. Now, if we now slide back to a kind of life that will not see the kingdom of God, not get to the kingdom of God, What's the use? Why did it we continue in the places where we were that wouldn't take us to the kingdom of God? We must be wise. You'll be wise. I said you'll be wise. Whosoever, these are the words of Christ, whosoever therefore shall not humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of God heaven. It tells us in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 3. In John chapter 3, reading from verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, except a man, a moral man, a religious man, except a man, a Jewish man, except a man, a church-going man, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus says unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus, you know what? We don't argue with the Savior. He came from heaven. He came to reveal to us how to get to the kingdom of God. And he has now said, except you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Argument will not solve the problem. Be a child. Alteration, altering the word of God. Can I not be a good Pharisee, a righteous Pharisee, a devoted Pharisee, and a worshiping Pharisee, a church going Pharisee, and still get to heaven? Alteration will not solve the problem. Arrogance cannot solve the problem. I'm a ruler in the land of Israel. How do you tell me I still must be born again? Addition, subtraction will not solve the problem. 
annulling, canceling the words that Christ has spoken. You must be born again. Will not solve your problem if you leave Christ now, Nicodemus, and you abandon what he has told you. That you must be born again. If you abandon that word, you'll be lost forever. There's no alternative. You must be born again. Look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and the works of the flesh will heed you. The life of the flesh will he live. The actions of the flesh will he commit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And the thing to do is to receive that, accept that as a little child. As a little child. We're looking at First Peter. First Peter, reading from chapter 1, First Peter, chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 14. First Peter, chapter 1, reading from verse 14. In verse 14 it says, And as obedient children, that's how to get to the kingdom of God, you hear the word of God, you have not seen heaven, Christ came from heaven. You don't know the way to heaven. Christ knows the way to heaven. And you do not know who are there, how they got there. Christ knows who are there and how they got there. And if you're going to get to heaven, you must be an obedient child. When he tells you, this is the way, walk you therein. If your interest is not just coming to church, coming to church, religious practice and you are you know like another denomination if that's not your interest you must be obedient to the word like a little child as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to your former laws in your ignorance but as see which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is reaching be ye holy for i am Holy. Look at chapter 2. We're looking at verse 2. Chapter 2. Reading from verse 2. As newborn babes desiring, desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. The little children, they desire the milk. They ask for the milk. They don't shun the milk. The same way, if you're going to be in the kingdom, and you're going to grow in the kingdom, you will desire the sincere milk of the world that you may grow thereby. We're coming to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. As a little child. As a little child. In Genesis chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 10. Genesis chapter 17, verse 10. This is my covenant, which he shall keep between me and you, and thy siege after thee. Every man, child among you shall be circumcised. Every man, child among you shall be circumcised. Now the child has been born, born again. And on the eighth day, they are going to circumcise the child. And the child is looking, what's that? What's that? What are you going to do with me? What do you call this one? He doesn't understand, but all the same, the little child will be circumcised. Look at verse 12. He that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man, child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money, of any stranger which is not of thy seed, all the same shall be circumcised. Verse 14. And he'll circumcise man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Circumcision for the child, the child cannot argue. 
The child cannot say, I don't like that one. I don't accept that one. You accept, you are a child, and you accept the kingdom of God as a child. Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're looking at verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Reading from verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. And we have to accept that because that's the will of God. That's the word of God. That's the way of the Lord. He wants us after we are saved to be circumcised in heart and to be sanctified. And we cannot be saying, well, that other church uh, does not preach holiness. That other church does not preach circumcision. That other church does not preach sanctification. That's not your problem. You have known it, you have heard it, that this is the word of God for every child in the land of Israel, every child in the family. And you receive and you accept the word of God without argument. Verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed. Those are the children. To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. That's the purpose. And with all thy soul that thou mightest live. I pray that this that Christ has emphasized, that if we're going to get to the kingdom of God, if we're going to abide in the kingdom of God, we receive the word, we accept the word as a little child, you will in Jesus' name. We will in Jesus' name. Look at Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 15. Very yes, say unto you, whosoever. Think about that. Whosoever. There are times, uh, you know, people come to church. When they come for the first time, for the first month, for the first year, they're all ears. They're hearing the word. They're soaking in the word. Then they become workers. They become ministers. They become leaders. They have this position, that position. All of a sudden, the higher they go, the cooler they become. And it appears the word of God does not matter anymore. They hear the word. They come to the Bible study. They come to the services. But they are not as passionate for the word like they used to be in this by. They hear the word the following hour, they are forgotten. The following day, they are forgotten. There are corrections to make in their lives. There are adjustments to make in their lives so they can align their lives to the word of God. But nothing is happening. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. I pray will enter the kingdom of God, will abide in the kingdom of God, and nothing will take us away from the kingdom in Jesus' name. Point number three now, Christ's acknowledged blessings distributed with kindness. He distributes his blessing. But you do see distribute the blessing too. Come to Mark <coughs> chapter 10. Verses 15 and 16. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. There are people who reach this passage. All they can think about will be little children. Little children. They do not understand that Jesus Christ is making use of the little child to teach the whole church. And is not limiting what he's teaching to only little children. He's using this as a symbol, as an emblem, as a practical thing. To teach the people what we ought to be, how we ought to be if we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. But as I said during the message, it's not just children. The children that have learned the ways of the world, 
the children that already know how to be violent, the children that are in the ways that are not good. Look at this. Number one is talking about a little child. Little child. We're coming to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 18. And we're reading from verse 4. He wants us to be little in our heart. He wants us to have the kingdom of God like a little child. Verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, he's talking to the adults, he's talking to everyone, he's talking to those who want to get to the kingdom, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Number two, it's actually talking about a lowly child. A lowly child. Look at Matthew chapter 11. In from verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. It's saying you must be as lowly as a child. It's talking about a living child. It ain't to bring a dead child before them to say, look at this dead child, receive, accept the word as this dead child. Uh-uh. A dead child cannot receive anything, cannot accept anything. It wants us to be as a little child as a lowly child, as a living child, living, not dead in sins and trespasses. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 3. In 1 Kings chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 7. Look at that. Kings chapter 3. Actually, I'm looking for 2 Kings chapter 3. Sorry, let's go back to that 1 Kings chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 7. All right, I'll, I'll get the verse. The verse is talking about the little uh, the, uh, problem that happened between those two women. And one woman said, the living child is mine. And the other one said, the living child is mine. And then Solomon proposed something that he will do. So that the mother of the living child will come out, will be revealed. I'm talking now, I'm looking now at verse 17. In verse 17, the one woman said, oh my Lord, I... And this woman dwelt, a dwell in one house. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass that the third day after I was delivered, this, that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house. Save we too in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at the midnight and took my son eh, that from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her a dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this woman said, No, the dead, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. 
does they speak before the king, verse 23, and then said the king, the one said, this is my son that liveth, and this thy son is the dead. And the other said, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. The king said, Bring me a sword. And he brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose living child was, was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child. And in no wise lay it. But the other said, Let it neither be mine nor thine, but divide it. And the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay, slay it, for she is the mother thereof. When the Lord said we must receive the gospel and the kingdom as a little child, you know what he meant? A little child, yes. A lowly child. A living child. You see, the child must be alive. If the child is alive, that's how he can receive the gospel. And if anyone is dead in sins and trespasses, a father, a mother, a preacher, a bishop, and even a child, and a youth, if he's dead in sins and trespasses, he cannot receive, he cannot even learn. You must be a little child at heart, a lowly child at heart, a living child at heart, a liberated child, liberated child. If the devil has bound their heart, if the devil has captured their heart, and they're not liberated from evil spirit, evil power, and from sorcery, they cannot receive the word of God. If you're influenced by Lucifer, if you're influenced by Satan, if you're influenced by familiar spirit, you cannot accept the word of God. You must be a liberated child. You must have the heart and the life of a liberated child in Mark chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 21, Mark chapter 9, reading from verse 21. And of times it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, and the Lord said, and Christ our Savior said, as Christ was teaching his own disciples, this father came with the child. The child had been bound, and the child had been tormented, and the child had been under the spell and under the yoke of an evil spirit. In that way, that child can receive nothing. That child can receive, cannot receive the kingdom of God. It is when the child is liberated, liberated from evil spirit, liberated from evil power, liberated from a binding spirit, a binding yoke. That's the only time that child will learn. The same thing with any adult, the same thing with anyone. When the source sweats the word, and then he doesn't understand this satan comes and he takes away the word that was sown in his heart you must be liberated like a little child like a lowly child like a living child like a liberated child in verse 23 it says jesus said unto him if thou canst believe all things are possible to him the believers, number five, you'll be a leaning child. Do you see how little children, they depend so much on their parents, they lean on them. They lean on them. You're leaning upon the Lord in your heart. You're not separated. 
In your heart, you're not uh, dissociated. In your heart, you're not running away. You're leaning upon the Lord like a leaning child. Those are the people that can receive the kingdom of God. Not the people that are so independent and the people that are so indifferent and they go their way every time you lean on him. We're looking at John. I'm reading from chapter 13 and verse 23. John chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 23. It says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. There is love between you and the Savior. You love him. You love his word, you love his declaration, and you're a loving child, a leaning child. Those are the people that can receive the kingdom of God. But those people whose hearts are hardened, those people whose hearts are independent, those people whose hearts are wayward, and they're not leaning upon the Lord, they cannot have the kingdom of God as they ought to have. I pray every one of us will receive the kingdom of God as a little child, as a lowly child, as a living child, as a liberated child, as a leaning child, as a longing child. What does that mean when your soul is longing? You're eager. You want what the Lord has. And you're a child longing for whom? A child longing for your parents. A child that loves the parents so much. You're longing. You're desirous. You want everything they have to offer. And it's the longing child. It's the one that has that longing heart. He wants the word of God. He's not fed up with the word of God. He's longing. He's longing. He's longing. Those are the people that receive the gospel and they receive the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God becomes beneficial unto them. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 14. Psalm 119, verse 40. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. I'm longing. I'm desirous. I want age. I'm not, you know, thinking that's enough. I've had enough milk. I've had enough word. I've had enough water. I've had enough attention. I've had enough instruction. I am longing. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Look at verse 131 there. Psalm 119. Verse 131. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for thy commandments. Those are the people that can have the kingdom of God and the benefits of the kingdom of God. Their hearts are longing. They're longing children. Look at verse 174. In verse 174, it says, I have longed for thy salvation. If he knows, if he doubts salvation, he says, that's the greatest sin I have on earth. That's the greatest sin I can have. Just coming to church without salvation, what will that pay me? And just reading the Bible without salvation, what will that profit me? I have longed for thy salvation. O oh Lord, thy law is my delight. Those are the people that receive benefit from the kingdom of God. You have a heart like that of a little child. A lowly child, a living child, a liberated child, a leaning child, a longing child, a lamb-like child. Lamb-like child. Not like lion-hearted, not like wild, like a wolf, but lamb-like child. We're looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading from chapter 8 and verse 32. Acts Chapter 8, verse 32. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, dumb, before a sharer's, so opened he not his mouth. This is a child who is all ears, eager to hear. Not, you know, the parents are talking, he's talking. The teachers are talking, he's talking. 
and their, you know, blah, 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 noise making and all that. But a lamp like child that is so eager to sink in the word of God, soak in the word of God, receive the word of God. Those are the people that will be blessed with the blessings of the kingdom. I pray you'll be like that. I said, I pray you'll be like that. I look at Psalm 45. Psalm 45. I'm reading from verse 2. The blessing, the blessing that he gives his people who are in the kingdom because they have the heart of a little child. In Psalm 45, verse 2, thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy leaves. Therefore, God has blessed thee forever. Because you are that kind of child at heart, that's why it says God has blessed you forever. Looking at Psalm 147, Psalm 147, I'm reading from verse 13. Psalm 147, reading from verse 13. For he has strengthened the bars of thy gates. He has blessed thy children within thee. When we have the right heart, and we come to hear the word of God, when we have the right heart, and we receive and accept the totality of the word of God, like little children, that's how he blesses us. He maketh peace in thy borders, and feeleth thee with the finest of the wheat. He sendeth forth his commandment upon earth. His word runneth very swiftly. His word runneth very swiftly. Look at Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. We're reading from verse 32. You have the right heart, the right kind of heart, and you receive and you accept the word, then the blessings flow in our lives. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 32, Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise. Hear instruction. Don't disregard instruction. Don't have in your heart against instruction. Don't throw instruction away. The word that brings salvation, hear and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gaze, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whosoever, whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. He that sinneth against me, wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me seek death. They love death. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Proverbs chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. When you are a father, you are a mother, and you are walking in integrity, your children will learn how you receive the word, how you cherish the word, how you obey the word, how you make the word a priority in your life. And your children will follow, and the children are blessed after him. A king that seated in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil, all evil with his eyes. Verse 11, even a child... Even a child, even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. I pray that the blessing of the word will be upon every one of us. Salvation for everyone. Sanctification for everyone. Holy Ghost baptism for everyone. Healing for everyone. Strength for everyone. Vision for everyone and a new 2020 accomplishment for everyone in Jesus' name. 
John, first John chapter 3. In first John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You'll be like him. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. A person who receives the gospel like a child will not reject that, will not doubt that, will not say, I cannot be pure. I cannot be righteous. I cannot be holy. You receive the word like a little child, like a lowly child, like a living child, like a liberated child, like a leaning child. You receive the word like a child whose heart is longing after the best of God. And it says, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Look at verse 8. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil seen it from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. All works of the devil will be destroyed in every life. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness, is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. You'll be a child of God. And the devil will not have the upper hand in your life in Jesus' name. Chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 5, verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God, sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. That's the blessing of the child of God. That wicked one will not touch you. He will not touch you or sin. He will not touch you or sickness. He will not touch you with oppression. He will not touch you with evil. The Lord will preserve your life as you receive the word of God like a little child in Jesus' name. No argument, amen. I said no argument, amen. No alteration, amen. No arrogance, amen. No addition, amen. No annulment, amen. No abandonment, amen. No anger, amen. No animosity, amen. And there is no alternative. You will abide in the word of God and the blessings of God will be overloaded in your life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. The necessity of childlikeness in kingdom citizens. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer before you go.